Yeah, I guess we'll wait for some more time. Sure. So that we can join yeah. you. Maybe I could just have a quick jam or something. Well, please. I'm surprised it's like um, that stall has been there under the residency road overwalk for, for many many years, okay. decades even. And uh, seven pani, uh, seven dahi puris for 30 rupees. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, wow. I mean, they sell it for 100, 150. So. If you go to fancy places and all, I'm sure, yeah. much more. Yeah. So, yeah, just waiting for Prithvi's instruction to start. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we'll start. Okay. So, welcome everyone to the ne next episode of Nuevo Live. We have a very special guest here with us. But before we go there, you must be wondering who's this new face. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, so, so definitely not a new face. I've always been behind the camera, guys. So, let me introduce myself first. I'm Shrikan, I'm heading the marketing efforts here at Nuevo. And so, yeah, really glad to have you with us, uh, Siddharth. Let's welcome our guest. Siddharth Dhavankar. Yeah. So Siddharth is a musician, a fermenter. Uh, he's part of different uh, various uh, sustainable communities and he also teaches at different alternative schools. And uh, in fact, we met Siddharth during one of our uh, initial experiments, if you remember. Yeah. Back at, uh, here at the farm in Sajapur. Uh, shout out to John at uh, Hamsa Organics. What up, John? <laughs> so yeah, we've, uh, he's been supporting us ever since. So. I think let's get to today's agenda. Sure thing. Yeah, so we've been uh, speaking a lot about uh, the sort of lack of uh, awareness that exists in mushroom. So there are like a billion species of mushrooms and we are aware of only a few. In, in our few of our attempts here uh, around in Bangalore, we have spotted close to four to five species of mushrooms. In fact, our uh, chief cultivator, Bion, who's here with us, he has uh, identified close to 15 to 16 species of mushrooms in Himachal Pradesh. Wow. So you have spent your time in multiple farms in back in Kodak uh, So can you share a bit of your experience foraging for mushrooms? In the foraging. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> firstly, since you brought up Bangalore, uh, ironically, when we met at, uh, at, at the farm in Sajapur, farm, yeah. uh, we also found some Claudia mushroom, which is a particular type of mushroom, Claudia wood ear. Yeah. These names can be kind of used interchangeably. I think there are subtle differences between these two mushrooms, but by and large, they look kind of the same and taste kind of the same. Yeah. And I haven't seen those mushrooms in Bangalore since I was a kid. So that was really, really nice. And it happened the same time that I, I met you guys as well, the whole Nuevo team. Yeah. The beginning. In so. fact, for, for isn't the activity so interesting that you sort of have to uh, tune into the nature, be at the nature space, slow down and take a closer look at this amazing organism. I totally agree because um, once perhaps somebody is shown a particular type of edible wild mushroom yeah. uh, and once one pays attention or you know is aware of the shape, the size and the area that that mushroom would grow in, yeah. it's like after that you only see those mushrooms. Everywhere. Everywhere <laughs> you, you see those mushrooms. So my favorite one, Claudia. Claudia. I think Auricularia. Latin no, name for it, I'm not too sure. Yeah. But it's so delicious. There are many ways you can cook it. Use it in broths, soups, stir fries, noodles, rices, and um, often found um, on a log which is under a bush. Mm -hmm. So if 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 there's rain and the rain like trickles down onto this log, yeah. You know that's like one very common area mm -hmm. where I found cloud mushrooms, cloudia mushrooms. They're found in a lot of lot of different. Uh, micro habitats, sure, I suppose, sure. but in Kore Canal, in a community that I've been helping out with a little bit uh, mm -hmm. called Yane Kadal. Shout out, yo, Shadi mm -hmm. School. Um, over there, particularly, I enjoy taking walks and looking for three kinds of mushroom, and one of them is the Cla Claudio. Claudio. And there's also a couple more. One is the oyster mushroom that Nubedo is, 
is growing. So I yes. mean, it grows very well in the wild as well. And um, there are some areas where it just keeps flushing and it almost wants you to pluck it yeah. so that it can come again. You know? It's very forgiving. Uh, it's I very forgiving, it. yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the last one, uh, which I wanted to say is parasol, mm -hmm. which is something that I haven't found as often, but I think is very, very tasty. When you cook it right, just with salt and pepper, it tastes like squid. And for all you vegan, vegetarian people, it tastes really nice. Yeah. Also. It seems like Siddharth has uh, found more mushrooms than us, so <laughs> I guess to finding new mushrooms, right? Yeah. Every day. Nice. So, yeah, talking about mushrooms, growing mushrooms has been the best experience in our lives. To have spend that much time uh, watching and learning from these organisms. We, we have put that much care and effort uh, in the kit that you see right now. So uh, you've had your share of growing your mushrooms. Of course, you tried out the, you know, the mushroom growing kit recently. Uh, tell us a bit about uh, your experience growing. Was it easier to grow it on your own? And uh, sure. more importantly, what has the mycelium taught you? Right, okay. So I mean, in terms of growing mushrooms, uh, my interest started, I think, about four or five years ago. And um, I've obtained spore from spore and spawn from different places, IHR being one of them, Science Farmers being another one. Mm -hmm. um, I think JR Agrotech yeah. is another one as well. So there, I mean, a couple of Bangalore players who were, who were selling spore and spawn. And um, my first few attempts were actually in Kodekana. Mm -hmm. And we tried it under this water tank. So there's a water tank and there's a small shed underneath that. Mm -hmm. And we were semi-successful. I think I sent you a stop-motion time-lapse I took oh, yeah. of the oyster mushrooms yeah. growing. So we grew some, but uh, it was also a very, very damp room. We had rat problems. We had problems like propagating. We had problems with the substrate. Um, it was all learning and yeah. I think by and large a fail. And um, I think by and large, anyway speaking, I'm not a scientist or a mycologist, but I do very much appreciate, acknowledge and accept their presence in our lives. So not only that, they're hella tasty. So oh, I yes. tried a couple more times as well growing. Okay. A couple of places in Bangalore as well. And um, again in Kodekanal. But what I found some, some of the times, I think also it needs kind of like constant dedication, passion and love. True. To really? a certain extent, especially if it's not oysters. For example, I inoculated some shiitake in a valley in Kodekanal at several yes. friends' farms. So I'm hoping in the next 20 years we get some. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. So these are some experiments, um, but one thing I really, that the mycelium I think taught me, especially because it kind of went hand in hand with foraging, so I actually also got to go to the forest and pluck. There was one point in time where I was trying to do both and I was getting much more from what I was foraging. Okay. So, you know, it's it made me think also, of course the process can be made more efficient, but at the same time, like, if you're around nature in, a, in an abundance, I think that that's also a really good place to go. True, true. So, yeah, I think this all finally, it, it culminated with um, me trying your oyster mushroom DIY box, which... Oh, um, yeah. Unfortunately, you don't, uh, it doesn't have it here right now. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, it's growing, growing really great. It's pretty amazing. Nice. How? So, I had a great time um, showing it to people and appreciating it myself because I really like the design, the packaging, the information. Thank Shows you. a lot of care and thought has gone into it. And not just that, I, <laughs> I remember at uh, the farm where we met, that uh, you were spending, you and your team were spending a lot of time making sure that you cut up the straw substrate into exactly the right size. Basically experimenting. And, with that, right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like just only hard work pays off, but I think also like care and thought into that. Yeah. So, I think that's something a lot of people I showed the box to really appreciated. Yeah. And finally, my family was over for the last five days. So, it started pinning and has just about finished and they left this morning. So, they saw the entire process and were blown away completely by the spectacle of it, the very spectacle. Very it's not even just about the quantity of mushrooms obtained or the fact that maybe now that you've been able to spray water on it, you're a mushroom grower. <laughs> but I think maybe more than that, the, the feeling of it, just watching it come out of the box is wonderful. Very, man. Yeah, very glad that you could uh, experience this. Like, yeah. so, like I was saying, a whole lot of uh, thinking and learning has gone, gone, gone to put out this kit out uh, for everyone. So. All this have helped us optimize it to be easily grown by anyone, right? I'm sure uh, yes. all of us with the mushroom farmers relate to this amazing growing experience as you have had with much success. So coming to a little bit of traditional culture, interesting fact, they call oyster mushrooms muskan in Himachal Pradesh. So there are different, different uh, 
cultures have different takes on mushroom. There are different stories, different recipes. In fact, Sipta has been telling me about uh, these traditional songs that were used by the Adivasis who talk about mushroom and a couple of other interesting stories as well. So maybe if you could. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, like culture and mushrooms have been intertwined like since humanity's existence, I suppose. Um, Terence McKenna has this theory called the stoned ape theory, which show, talks about like unleashing the power of imagination into language mm -hmm. via consumption of psilocybin mushrooms. Um, there's also, like you were mentioning, um, an old Adivasi song which yeah. connects lightning with mycelium because lightning can fix nitrogen and uh, mycelium loves to consume nitrates. It sort of shocks the mycelium to think. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, one tends to almost notice a growth spurt mm. from an area that's been myceliated after the lightning strike. And this is not something new. Like, uh, like I said, there's a very popular song which talks about the mycelium eating the lightning and then oh. growing the mushroom. Okay. So it's pretty beautiful. And, and like culture has numerous references of mushroom and human coexistence. For mm -hmm. example, uh, Soma or Somras, which uh, some people, yeah, I mean, some people have called it an immortality drink. Um, it's been mentioned in the Ayurveda for, in Ayurveda for millennia, I think. And um, many people do attribute it to being an Amanita muscaria, mm -hmm. I think fly agaric, uh, agaricus, agaricus mushroom. mushroom. Um, but definitely, it's also been figured as a child of the thunderstorms. Mm -hmm. So it's mentioned, I think, in the Ayurvedas as well that this Soma derivative is a child of the thunderstorm. And in Iraq, when uh, it, there's a lightning strike in the desert, okay. people go out after the strike to search for desert truffles. Truffles are another type of mushroom. Yeah. So expensive, expensive and very fancy and nice smelling. Yeah. Sure. Have you had truffles? Uh, maybe not. But then I've had truffle oil. Truffle oil, definitely. Yeah. We bought some from the vegan market that we had. Oh, nice. That's, that's cool. pretty good. Nice. So I think this is also something we try, uh, with Noveda, we try to bring it to the table. Uh, connecting the old and the new. That's mm -hmm. how we coined the name also, new plus Ved. Right, so that's that's a brilliant insight. Uh, nice. Yeah. yeah, I think the contemporary like understanding has to incorporate the old stuff, but can in no way not look forward as well. We have to like you know work with what we got. So I like yeah. that. Even uh, the Japanese scientist I was telling about earlier, yeah. who um, manufactured lightning in a box so that he could zap my CVM and watch them grow, and he played Beethoven or Mozart music and heavy metal and see the differences and. There's also this dude on Instagram, Michael Lyko, who makes music from the mushrooms mm, by yeah, plugging yeah. in electrodes and uh, okay. calculating true, the potential true, true. difference and making music out of that. Correct, correct. So yeah, culture and mushrooms. Yeah, I think this is a good segue to what I was going to say next. So the potential of fungi is immense. Like you almost feel like quite literally everything seems possible with fungi. Right. Uh, so it has, I mean, when you talk about fungi leather, it has increasing, increasingly been meeting consumers is aesthetic and functional uh, expectations. So you have worked with SCOBY. Uh, yes, uh, I actually make and sell kombucha. Uh, it's a probiotic beverage. Yeah, I think, uh, so, so this yeah. is uh, Sid's kombucha over here, which I personally ordered for myself. So Cheers, man. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> no alcohol, by the way. <laughs> and this is vetiver flavored. Vetiver is a root, also known as khas. So, yeah, I make and sell this kombucha and um, what you use primarily as the mother to make every new batch of kombucha from steeped tea mm -hmm. is something called a scoby. Symbiotic culture for bacteria and yeast. Exactly. Right. So it's an algal mat that you immerse in the, in the tea and uh, tea, tea mixture. Yeah. And uh, you leave the ferment for two weeks or so, two to three weeks, mm -hmm. depends on the strength of your scoby. And uh, you have kombucha. Oh, right. The scoby has eaten all the caffeine away and converted all the sugars mm -hmm. into really healthy stuff. So it's good for your gut, it improves gut health, your microbiome, diversity, gut flora. And uh, not just can the scoby be used to make kombucha, but you can also use it to make sweets and candy oh. by cutting it up, mixing it with some sugar and frying it yeah. or sun drying it or baking it. And you can also use it as an alternative to make um, vegan leather. Now, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I was uh, getting to this. So, leather, you can consider it as a co uh, product of uh, meat production and life, uh, lifestyle farming, which is 
the whole process is ethically uh, questionable. Right. I mean, and it's not just uh, the dead animals that we eat whose skin we use for bags. Right. But we're also making and growing animals for the skin yeah. as well. Right. So environmentally so, very unfriendly as well. Exactly. So this is where uh, uh, sustainable uh, leather was made from fungi materials comes to play. Right. Or if this, this, this can be called one of it. Yeah, definitely. So biofabrication, right? Yeah. A huge potential of mycelium. Correct. Um, to grow things, to make shoes. I think Adidas or somebody made a shoes out of yeah, Adidas. mycelium. Yeah, Adidas. And, a lot uh, of different stuff. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So I think processes have to be refined. But I do think that this is a kind of problem in mentality that we're having as a community at large, which is about sustainability and the effort that it takes to switch to a new system, just because of our sort of like laid back uh, norm of being in an older system, mm -hmm. which has its own flaws, its own maintenance needs, and is also kind of ethically not the greatest, whether it be burning coal, Great. using petrol, you know, like, of course, to make an electric vehicle, we still do have to, like, plunder the planet, but we're also running it on electricity rather than millions of years of stored energy via petrol that's being released. So, I yeah. mean, things like this need to be taken into an equation. I also work with biogas okay. and, you know, a mentality of people where we all put our poops into cubes and they all go to a septic tank, mm -hmm. you know, and um, poop is gold, poop is Selected. energy. Unused, unused yeah. potential. I mean, there's a book called The Human Your Handbook, which talks about the usefulness of poop. Mm -hmm. So, just likewise, I'm just experimenting with these scoby. I make kombucha out of them, but right. I just wanted to have an experiment about how it would turn out into leather. So, you know, I tried with a few different thicknesses of scoby. You can see this guy is thinner and he's kind of torn. It's pretty cool. This guy is thicker and uh, you can see it up in the light. But I think so I kind of like different it duration this. taken in different duration or yes, the different durations, different thicknesses, different ages, mm -hmm. and I've also brushed them with coconut oil and beeswax. Shout out to Fungalam, thanks for that tip. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's just interesting. I haven't definitely finalized the process. It's like a little, nice little pouch. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, lots so, of things. Yeah. So I guess guys, you know whom to contact if you need kombucha or. Uh, anything kombucha, right? Cheers, man. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, I guess we, uh, let's just look at uh, what uh, the followers have to say if we have any questions. Yeah, so Sibi is like hashtag my senior leather, of course. Nice. <laughs> What's up, Sibi? Been a while. <laughs> Alright, so I think this has really been an interesting talk. And uh, also, when you're talking about, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, so my sustainable leather, there's also other aspects to how a fungi can... Uh, right, apart from just food. Apart from just food, so there's micro-remediation, maybe. Right. You were talking to me about micro-remediation. So yeah, yeah, I was. It's something I feel very passionately about because of the scope of our plastic problems today and the fact that mycelium, certain types, can consume plastic and help, to grow, help them grow better. But not just that, particularly in Kodai Kanal, um, Unilever's mercury factory thermometer leak, which happened almost like 20 years ago now. Um, and more recently, in Jan or Feb of this year, the felling of their trees in their compound. So if people are aware, a um, couple of decades ago, there was a huge thermometer factory. Uh, the factory dumped thermometers everywhere at... Um, like these shops which sell scrap, scrap okay. shops, yeah. and also directly into the forest outside their property. And till today, there have been genetic deformities in humans, fish, there's mercury in the soil, in the air, in the water, all in one particular side, I think Pambar Shola side of Kore Kanal. And um, what they did now, I think for the last eight to 10 years, there have been quite a lot of activism and campaigning, songs have been made, um, but what they did, the Unilever factory, despite giving a compensation a few years ago, have cut their trees on the compound, which basically means all of that tree cover which was storing that remaining poisoned mercury mm -hmm. is gone. So all of that mercury in the last 10 months has been leached into Kodai Kanal. It. And it's horrible. And um, I was teaching at a sustainable school in Kodai called Shole. Um, when I was teaching chemistry over there, I think a student of mine made a project. You shared the picture. Yeah. Right, and it's beautiful yeah. artwork of these like buffed up mushrooms with machine guns <laughs> shooting mercury molecules, methyl mercury molecules yeah. that are coming out of the waterfall and stuff. So, you mentioned remediation. 
I think uh, mushrooms, are, mushrooms and bacteria, both of these things highly overlooked in today's society. I can empathize with uh, your feelings about mushrooms and mycelium yeah. because I make kombucha and I feel that way about bacteria too. True. And these are two zones or facets of life that society has just culled out. Yeah. So I think in terms of the potential it has to either suck up the mercury that's in the soil and water in Kode Canal or our plastic issues or fabrication. Yeah, I think there's also a petition going on to add fungi to flora and fauna. Interesting. Yeah. So I mean, isn't it, it's its own thing though, right? It's but its own it, thing. Yeah. yeah. Flora, fauna and, and fungi. fungi. <laughs> <laughs> right? Nice. So, guys, if you have any questions uh, for Siddharth, otherwise... Or Shikhan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Patma Venkat is like fantastic, refreshing drink. That's my mom. Probiotic kombucha. So, yeah. Hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so I guess let's get to the important, I mean special part of the <laughs> life. So Sid here will be uh, performing a special musical demonstration yeah. with this ancient musical instrument. So maybe if you, if you can start introducing each Absolutely. instrument and then have a spectacle, spectacular musical performance. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, when I walked into the Nivedu HQ, the first thing I saw was this. <laughs> it's beautiful rain stuff. And um, I think that sound is a really important aspect of our lives. I also make and play ancient instruments. And um, I also like the connection between sound and fungi. Coincidentally, like I mentioned, the Instagram of Michael Leiko, um and the songs that yeah. people have made. But I think in general, something in the last few years that has drawn me closer to music is tribal or indigenous or ancient instruments. Mm -hmm. To be able to like understand and play these do not require an encyclopedia of knowledge. They don't need a roster or a canon of songs to practice from, unlike a guitar or a veena. Yeah. Which nothing wrong with that indoctrinated approach. You know, you do learn a lot, but there's kind of less room for intuition. Mm -hmm. And it's almost demanded by these instruments that you have to have this introspective value to yourself if you want to learn the basic technique of the sound. Yeah. So, for example, this is an ancient instrument called asalato mm -hmm. or kaskas. It's made from two gourds, G-O-U-R-D-S, like sorekai or birkai, bottle gourd, snake gourd. Like that, there are gourds that grow in Africa. Yeah. And people collect them and they've been using it as a percussive instrument yeah. for ages. And it's a dying art now. The Japanese have kind of repopularized it, but apart from just shaking it, you can also have a clack. Oh. You can have like a chain sound. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's one Pretty of them. Amazing. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Yeah. So you made them on your own? Or? No, these ones I purchased. I mean, I'm okay. actually having difficulty getting the gourd or the seeds. Okay. So these have come all the way from Africa. But I make and, uh, and sell them as well, but uh, out of plastic. Oh, the thing is, it's so easily available and the amount of introspective scope it has for either a child or an adult to understand fractions, timing, introspection, I find immense value in, in all of these ancient instruments. So the next one. Oh, my favorite. Nice. <laughs> it's called a Morsing from Tamil Nadu, but actually it has over 900 names yeah. found in all old world cultures because of that basic physics of how it operates, which is two solid things and a pliable yes. thing in between. Do you use your mouth to amplify? Got it, yeah. So even a guitar, for example, mm -hmm. the sound box yeah. is like your mouth. So a lot of instruments have actually come from this instrument. So like I've seen a bigger one yeah. that's almost as big as my hand. Wow. So does the size make a difference to the sound? Or? Absolutely, the size yeah. and the material. So I make them out of bamboo as well. And there's some okay. fantastic stories with this instrument too. Like it's called Gogona in Assam. Okay. The women keep them in the hair. Mm. Take it out, whip the hair out, around the fire, start dancing and playing. Start jamming. <laughs> start jamming and um, so that's called Gogona. There's okay. different materials and there's over 900 names to this instrument because it's that old. Yeah. So I think, you know, by and large people today might not even know of the existence of such an instrument and I very much seek to resuscitate those knowledges. So here's what it sounds like. <laughs> Yeah. 
Pretty cool. <laughs> cool, man. <right? laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. So, uh, not only is is the sound pretty unique, yeah. but like, in order to be able to grasp that technique of how to play, or even this one, how to... It requires a certain amount of introspection. Mm. So, which is why I find it invaluable instruments for teaching Your music. Idea. Yeah. So, yeah. And finally, the last one. Uh, this one is made out of PVC, but I make them out of bamboo. And I have one out of teak as well. This is called a didgeridoo. Didgeridoo, yeah. From Australia, Aboriginal instrument. Uh, again, fantastic stories. Made from eucalyptus originally. Mm. That's hollowed out naturally by termites. Yeah. So, oh, that is actually the OG didgeridoo. I guess a lot of people won't consider this a didgeridoo, but I think, again, just like the asalato, for the sake of spreading something that's so forgotten, yeah. for the sake of its potential, its introspective value, for the sake of the fact that we're going with many more indoctrinated instruments and forgetting out on a lot of tradition and culture, mm -hmm. um, this sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> Termites does more than one thing. So we had a recent post. Uh, Termitomites? Yeah, so they Termitomices. Yeah, term termites actually farm cultivate mushrooms. So the, they use fungal cones uh, to build the structure of the mounds. Oh, and uh, yeah, amazing. The fungi basically breaks down uh, the uh, organic matter. And which that becomes their feed. Amazing. Yeah, so that's so I amazing. think uh, Paul Stamets has mm -hmm. like actually patented or like he discovered, I'm not sure which one it is, mm -hmm. a few species of term termitomyces, termitomyces yeah, oh. which work together like fungi and the termites. Yeah, they have different names like in uh, Africa, I think it's called Omajoa. Omajoa. Uh, it's like really these huge mushrooms. Oh. And this is, yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah, I'm fascinated by this world of fungi, man. So oh. like, oh, oh, truly, yes. very, very glad to even be part of this talk and like, yeah. always experimenting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is really an interesting chat. Uh, I think this calls for winding up. I mean, like okay. I said, fungi is fantastic. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Sid, for... Yeah, thanks, man. This. Thanks so much for having me. Nivedo, awesome scene, Shrikan. This is thank amazing. You. Also, guys, we put out uh, content just for you. Uh, so please keep supporting us. Please like, share, and comment on our post. Because it helps us a lot. And we love interacting with you. So uh, with that, until next time, uh, namaste and good night.